Angie, thank you. Um, I want to welcome you all. Thank you all for attending this meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee. We are proceeding uh, virtually uh, in accordance with authority granted by the governor uh, during the COVID outbreak, which continues to this day. So I want to call this meeting to order. I'm going to ask the committee members to signify their attendance vocally when I call your name. Sharon? Here. Thank you. Christine? Here. Alex? Alex? Oh, sorry. I said here. Yeah. And Paul? Didn't hear you, Paul. Present. Very good. And Austin is also uh, also Austin is also present. OK, the first order of business is the approval of minutes from the 24th of May. Is there a motion to approve I, those I, minutes? I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. OK, any corrections to the minutes? Just to add an S to the word plants on the Kinsey Garden. <laughs> It says the Kinsey plant. <laughs> okay, with that, um, with that correction, are we ready to vote? Sharon? Yes. Christine? Yes. Alex? Yes. Paul? Yes. And Austin votes yes. Thank you, and thank you to Angie. The next item is a financial update from our finance director, who seems not to be present. So our finance director is in the finance committee meeting and he'll be there probably for, he'll jump over when he's finished with that meeting. We've sort of split duties today. Okay, so maybe we'll come back to the financial mm -hmm. update when Sean joins us. Thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a uh, next item is the update from Colliers. Craig. Thank you, Austin. I'll share my screen. And, um, all right, so you should be able to see that now. Here is the schedule that we've been looking at for um, the last couple of weeks. I'm having a hard time zooming in. But um, if I could zoom in, it would be clear to see that our red line of you know current status has moved into June, and that puts us right smack dab in the middle of schematic design. Just mm -hmm. as a reminder to everyone, schematic design is the time when the design team continues to uh, take in information and uh, incorporate it into the, to the design of the building. Um, it's the time when public comment has the most impact and we're about halfway through that. And so schematic design will wrap up by the um, end of July. And um, so that's where we are at present. Great. Let's see, sorry, I'm flashing back to our agenda. No real update on the interim locations, um, no new information since our last uh, meeting. And unless there are any questions, I'll turn things back to the chair. So any questions for Colliers? Craig, if you could take down your screen share, that would be Will do. fabulous. So any question for Colliers? Okay, and uh, Craig, near as you know it, the work on the schematic design, we will hear from FAA, but the work on the schematic design goes as it should be going? Yes. Fabulous, okay. So next are the reports from our subcommittees. Uh, Christine, for the design subcommittee. Okay, we've been busy since our last uh, group meeting here. We met on uh, first May 27th, and we um, got a floor by floor presentation by the designers uh, regarding the updated schematic design. And we also discussed uh, bathroom design, including gender inclusivity options, um, which on both of those things, they were gonna go back um, from our questions to collect more data and more information, and then be ready to bring it to this group. Um, which will be happening today. Um, 
So our second design subcommittee meeting was on June 3rd. Uh, and that was on uh, another issue that the designer needs some decisions from us on regarding exterior um, materials and design. Uh, so they did a presentation to us mostly about siding on the exterior walls and some on windows and on roofing options. And again, we discussed that with them. Uh, they did have a presentation with some helpful slides that shows some examples of materials and you can find that on the town website under um, under the design subcommittee. It's, it's uh, under the June 3rd, um, which you can look at. And uh, so today we have uh, at least two people from um, Feingold Alexander. And because there's some issues that we need to decide on today or very soon, um, on bathrooms and the exterior um, materials. So the design subcommittee, the next meetings are gonna be on the 16th, where we're gonna discuss again, round two of public comments and prepare them and narrow that down so that we can send those and forward those to the designers so they can include these um, ideas and thoughts in the schematic design. And then there will be another regular design committee meeting on June 24th, Friday at nine, it's usual time. Um, so today, I don't know how you wanna do this, Mr. Chair, but um, we have two people. They, we, we can turn, you know, however you wanna handle it. And I wanna be, handle it. I think we wanna be clear that we are not uh, gonna be making any final decisions in this meeting. That what we've asked FAA to do, especially with respect to the exterior materials is to give the committee a kind of early look so that members of the committee that were not present for the design committee could weigh in. So Tony, uh, why don't you uh, lead us through what you have to lead us through? I just want to interrupt one more time. So however, FAA on those, I mean, they can set us straight on how quickly they need in, you know, as we roll along schematic design, exterior designs and the uh, bathroom designs, and there was also an issue about elevators and whether or not we're going to have two elevators or one elevator and the historic um, aesthetic looks that are, you know, could be a problem with them, uh, those options. So those are the three issues I think they're bringing today. Thank you, Christine. Tony. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, but we're going to focus really on today's exterior. Uh, we are still working through uh, looking at the elevator Great. issue, Christine, and the and the bathroom mm -hmm. issue. So I'm going to just lead you through um, what we had presented with a few additional slides to flush it out. Thank so you. this, of course, represents your current library, and what we are really trying to be sensitive to is the kind of nature of this library, the beautiful stone cladding material, and how in our new design edition can be complementary to this. So this is by way of jumping off in terms of looking at the palette and the materiality. So this uh, was the original renderings that um, was shown at the schematic level from the front, the same kind of view, but seeing the addition that is, you know, I see so you can see here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but it's in this location and the proposed addition. And in this instance, it's shown as brick with a metal roof system. And then the rear, um, a rendering where the form of the library steps down in scales, you can see towards the back garden area. Um, here you can see uh, what is represented here is that we have a, 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 a what we call a scalping slate base, uh, which is really essentially slate um, and then brick above with metal roof and metal dormers and then a very series of window wall, curtain wall type systems. So what we've actually been able to prepare um, it's a couple of variations on this that we're going to now share with you. So the first variation that we actually were able to um, advance the rendering view is all brick. So this is now looking at the entire uh, proposed addition mm -hmm. in brick, including the base and the upper part. And that's what you're seeing represented in this rendering. Um, so this is a variation from what you just previously was shown. And in the brick, uh, of course, there's a, a quite a wide range of brick as we know. There's many different colorways. Uh, these are just some 
uh, screen shared graphs of some things, but we are thinking in terms of the kind of the warm gray tans, light browns, which is complementary to the existing library. So that's what you're seeing here. And these pictures to the right kind of illustrate just some other buildings, um, how the brick, of course, can vary and have texture and sort of um, scale. Uh, so there's obviously a huge range of brick. <clears throat> This next version here is now looking at an all slate building. Um, and here, this is the same sculpt, sculpt, what we call sculpting slate, and, and we'll explain that in a minute, which is a slightly different and slightly darker tone against a lighter tone above, but this entire wing is an all slate. Um, so in terms of what this is, so the type of slate that we are looking at here, this is called sculptings. And essentially, for lack of a better word, it's sort of when they, when they cut slate and, and manufacture and produce it, uh, they actually have leftover scraps that are literally like, you know, elements. So what you see here is kind of looking like a fairly random pattern of different sizes, different shapes, but it's cut in such a way that when it's laid up in, in the, you know, for buildings, it's actually very organized and very tight. Um, so it has the qualities in some ways of almost field zone like uh, features. Um, so they creates variation, but they actually in variation, uh, but this is actually how this looks. And just by way of contrast, for example, this upper portion of this project that we did at Tufts is also slate, but it's panelized. And that's what you see the more traditional kind of blue green range that most people are used to. So this, but what we're really looking at is this, because this is actually more cost effective use of slate in point of fact than this. Okay. Another option we looked at is metal. Um, and we'll explain this in the middle. So here, what we're seeing in the upper part here is a proposed metal siding system which is creating a horizontal relief um, in detail it's kind of as a in some ways as a contemporary nod to almost like clapboard siding uh, over a slate base in this case but it could also be over a brick base but this is a change in material here representing metal and this particular metal actually we did use um, in another library project a few years back in Framingham and it's this portion of that library in particular that we're I want to draw your attention to because what this product does is it it's both um, very sustainable because it's actually highly insulating. What you're seeing here in these two versions, which has in the yellow color, that's all insulated panel. So it's 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 very efficient, very lightweight, but uh, very insulated. And it's, it comes in larger segments, uh, but then the, each individual segment has this kind of scale and texture. So this actually here is a combination of these two mixing together to create this kind of horizontal relief detail that you see here. And this is also uh, something which is uh, a natural finish, so it will not have the issue of like the paint killing and other things. So it, it, it uh, should have a very long lasting life. And, and we also found this to be very economical in terms of what was used here. So in, in summation, um, what we're looking at here and exploring is four options. What I will share with you is that we are getting uh, costing estimating done in the variations, but we do not have information to share with you today. Um, but it is being, they are looking at this. So this in, in a sense represents four ways, but I, I'm certainly would love to hear your at least initial reactions to these different approaches. All right. So uh, Tony, thank you for, thank you for that. Uh, let's dive in and let's hear what people have to say, Christine. Um. I don't want to comment yet. I just want to clarify. What was the first option again? Was that brick over this one, slate? Brick over slate. Yes. This is the, this okay. is the original design right here. Thank you. Can you scroll up a little bit, Tony, to see the names the other way? I'm oh, sorry, this way? Yeah, I just want to see what the name is. So it's all slate, metal over slate. I see. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> So it would be helpful. Yeah, Sharon. I'm sorry. So um, I, I don't love the all anything. And this is just my opinion. And, you know, what difference does my happiness make? <laughs> As Austin always says, uh, I don't love the all anything. I love the brick over the slate. Um, I'm also interested in a hint of the metal, but I think there's too much metal and the metal over the slate. I wonder what would happen if this if the metal were on the base and then you had um, either the brick or the slate on the top. That's just me. Tony, what I think yeah, I, I think probably what we should do is to to get people to comment, you collect the comments and then you respond after everybody's kind of weighed in. Of course. Uh, Sharon, take down your hand if you would. 
Alex? Thanks. Um, so the original schematic design is cost estimated 100% brick or, or brick with the sculpting. And am I correct that brick is the most expensive of the options? So an all brick option actually increases our costs as opposed to decreasing our costs would be my questions. <laughs> okay. So and again, Sharon, I love you, but I very much dislike the idea of putting metal siding on the bottom. It feels very backwards to me. You want your foundational materials on the bottom. <laughs> um, so to me, that seems off balance. Um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily against including the metal. Um, again, I think the idea was to go for sort of the big house, back house, little house barn idea. So I don't know to the extent that, and we certainly have wood siding on the front of the building. Um, so I, I'm not sure what that might look like, but. Okay. Uh, I think I next saw Paul and then Christine. Paul. Thank you. Um, so uh, the qu first question, I assume that this is a metal roof continues throughout all of them. So yeah. it's a matter of how they interact. I think the second point is these, these version, this view is one thing, but I'm really interested in how the front view looks because I'd like, I'm really interested in knowing how the interaction between the existing building and this, the materials look, and we don't have versions of that. So that would be interesting for me to see. And thirdly, um, uh, 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 price sensitive, um, obviously, because I know our pricing is going to be out of whack and we're going to have to cut somewhere and this might be the best, one of the good, best places to do it. And lastly, um, I sort of find the um, metal ghastly. Um, so um, just when we have these four versions, I sort of, I think I always like to see a differentiation between the um, foundation, uh, the alleged foundation and the, and the rest of the building. I think that it, it makes the building seem smaller in terms of massing. Thank you, Paul. Is ghastly an architectural term? <laughs> it is, actually. Okay, good. Thank you. So, Christine and then um, Anika. Christine? Um, so, I'm wondering, cost-wise, uh, well, first, I want to agree with Sharon that I don't like all anything. I do like a mix of textures. I think that would be nice. Um, and I also agree with Paul that, you know, cost and having it look really great, but you know, thinking what might save us some money. Um, so between slate, the sculptured slate and the metal, is there much of a price difference? Like meaning if we went with the metal, is that a savings um, if, if we mixed it with something? And the second part is a design thing. You know, I know we have the, the roof, the metal roof, which appears gray there. And then I'm looking at the fourth option. We have slate on the base and then the metal. Um, and in this case, it looks like a cream or a yellow, whatever. And I'm just wondering, like, is that the color that the designers you all were thinking would be the best or are there other colors you're considering? And does the roof also have to be that gray, just where you're thinking about colors and what options we have? Thank you. Right, so let's get Anika in, Tony, and then if you would respond and we'll, we'll go from there, Anika. Sorry, so I share the same um, cost concerns. Um, and also, I agree that it would be helpful to see the, the front facade just to see that flow um, and interaction. Um, and also, I do agree that I like the differentiation um, for texture um, as opposed to blank, even though here visually the all slate seems to show that the difference in, in texture as well. Um, so those those are my thoughts. So what I'd like to do is now give Tony a chance to respond to what he's heard so far, and then uh, Christine and Alex will get back. So Tony. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'll try to answer them based on I just quickly jotted down um, the questions that raised. So um, first, with respect to cost, um, unfortunately, I can't share with you today what the differential is between the various options because their estimator is still going through this and they've been exploring where that is. So I don't wanna um, get out there in front of the cost estimator in terms of trying to say something if um, we don't have it confirmed. Um, I think one I think thing we'll say though, is that when we looked at 
the metal in the other library in Framingham, for example, one of the reasons I actually went to metal was because it was cost effective uh, as opposed to masonry. So in that instance, for the, at least that library that was done, you know, about five, six years ago, that's why it ended up there. Um, and for other reasons too, the design is different, of course. Um, I think with respect to the uh, slate versus brick um, issue, I, I absolutely hear the, the interest and express desire, it seems for the most part that folks really like creating that separation. And I think for the reasons of scale, uh, I think that's why when we did the design in the upper left, that's what we were thinking about. But uh, because we wanted to explore these other options to get your reactions, and clearly we have, um, that's where we are. But uh, clearly having that differential that's in the upper left version, the original design, I think does help to break the scale down. I think it does render the, I think the kind of the tide in some ways, the base that sculpting quality has in some ways a more direct tie in some respects to the original building because it's stone um, and it has that kind of variation, although the color is different. Um, then with respect to the idea of um, the front view, um, we certainly won't, when, can create the front perspective rendering. We just, in the limited amount of time we actually had between the, when we met with the committee last week, um, we were actually very pleasantly surprised that they were able to do this uh, within two or three days. Um, mm. So we certainly can push forward to say, Let's have them look at the front, but if, unless there's a clear, like, well, we really don't like this anyway, so don't bother rendering that, but we can certainly do it and they're, and they're fast and they can do all three of these alternates pretty quickly. So we can do it just to complete the circle on this, just so that we have full um, analysis on front and rear. Um, and then with respect to, um, I think the other thing was, well, I think most of it was re related to, to that. And as far as the color is concerned, so the, on the metal version, uh, yes, there are variations in the panel color. Uh, they, they do come in some range, but because it's a more uh, baked and finished, they do tend towards a more lighter palette, like the silvers, the grays, the, those kind of things, as opposed to you know very bright colors, which um, I think we wouldn't want here anyways. So uh, the rendering is, it's, it's always interpreted because it's taking off um, what the render is interpreting the sample. But when we show the example from that other library, that's actually more of a silver white. And you're right, it does interesting look a little bit kind of cream color here. Um, but if we really went down this path with metal, of course, what we would have in front of the committee is like, well, here's the real samples. So you can see actually what it really looks like. Because ultimately we're gonna have to have some way to actually convey to you what the real materials are, um, especially against the existing building, which ultimately we would wanna do no matter what. Um, and then with respect to the roof, um, Again, the, the kind of the, I'm going to just flip back for a second. We did have some other um, images here, which I didn't show you, but uh, for example, on the roofing, the standing seam roofing is a fairly standard common product uh, that's used throughout uh, our region. And I'm sure you've all seen mud roof and the roof can come in a wide range of colorways too. Uh, I think we were, we were leaning towards the kind of the gray palette again, because when we, when we're thinking about this in relation to the existing building, I'm sorry, I'm gonna push back to the front beginning. Um, and if you look at the, what you're looking at here, um, your existing library essentially has a fairly dark actually roof, which of course is shingles. So I, I think the coloration of what this material is and how it not only complements this material, but how it also reacts against this material. I think these are all kind of subject to um, uh, kind of refinements. Um, I will also re remind folks that these dormers here, this is also clad in metal as well. So that's why when we looked at the, um, the metal roof system, it's built into the same product line, but there is variation possible within the color of the metal itself. Tony, I just wanna ask you to comment on something that Sharon said in the design committee and repeated today, which is, um, is it, would it be feasible uh, in some way, both design, the cost and aesthetics to do, uh, if you go down a little further, to do part of the building in metal? So go down, go down to your four, uh, your four alternatives, which are very helpful to see. So Sharon has some idea that maybe you wouldn't do the whole building in metal. And she's referenced the possibility of using it somewhere. Is there, is there, is that? A possibility, and if so, where is the likeliest somewhere that it could be used? 
So I think, um, of course, anything is possible, but I think one of the things I think this view is really telling, at least us, is that these uh, forms are kind of scaled into kind of two masses, as it were, right? I mean, we have this wing, we have this wing, mm -hmm. and they're read kind of volumetrically. And in some ways, your existing library is the same, right? Because the front and the sides of the historic part is all stung. And so, um, so having that consistency of a material reading through the fronts and the sides is one thing. The other thing I think is that when we look at how you would even attempt to break the materials, um, we did think this was the most rational way because it establishes again a base. Um, and I think to Alex's point, uh, we, we also tend to agree with this is that the base tends to want to feel more solid. And there's another practical reason too, which is that from a maintenance standpoint, um, bringing the metal down to the ground, you know, you have all sorts of issues you have to deal with in order to protect the bottom of the metal versus coming on top of slate or stone or, you know, brick. It's a lot easier. So I think, I think if we're going to do this approach at all, I think we either sort of head towards this or we don't, because I think flipping it and reversing it, like uh, another, another consideration too, is that um, conceptually thinking about a heavier material like masonry over a lighter material like metal, kind of reverses the intuitive nature of like gravity. You tend to think buildings, why they plant buildings and anchor them with a more massive solid material at the ground and light it up. And, uh, and many times houses do the same thing, even if they're wood siding, if they introduce stone or anything or brick, it always tends to run along the bottom foundation and then above you change the material. So long answer um, to your question, uh, Austin, is that I think it's, it's, it's at the moment, at least for now, for me, hard to, think about a different way. We can certainly give us some more thought, but at the moment, this is why we did it the way that we did. Uh, so I just want to just pursue Sharon's question one more time, if I may, Tony. So that was persuasive what you said. And this is, I'm now trying to imagine what Sharon might have been thinking. But for example, could you do the back of the building where you show, right, the metal over slate, do the back of the building in slate or brick, and then do the side facing the stronghouse in metal. Is is that feasible from either a design or again, trying to figure out what? Um, I guess we'd have to look at that, Austin. Okay. Um, there's, always the, there's always the question that we have um, ultimately, especially at intersections when one material intersects another material. Yeah. This is a lot easier to separate here because we have a natural, uh, what we call a horizontal yep. course that immediately makes a break. If we have this material joining a different material here at the corner, for example, yeah, yeah, you just have to think to yourself, okay, how is if it's brick or slate, then yep. it makes metal. We can, of course, detail that, and we would as designers, but that's the kind of thing that immediately we jump to right away. Okay, all right. So I think I saw um, Alex, Christine, and then Paul. Alex, thanks. So um, something I think it was Christine said reminded me in the. Um, design meeting that I watched, Ellen Anceloni made a comment um, on the brick, that red brick like we have now is not an option. And I was curious why that was. Um, and then following up on that also, you know, I don't know if this is renderings, but the, the colors of the renderings look very different than the sort of brick, you know, um, examples that you have on the prior slides. So I don't know whether that's just uh, how it reads in the rendering versus, right? Like these, oops, so yeah, go yeah, right here. So like these seem much warmer sort of tans um, yeah. than what it looks like in the rendering. So I just don't know whether that's rendering and I should really be looking, you know, more like the Magnolia Ridge or just, I don't know, I don't know which of these brick choices in theory I'm looking at that yeah. helps me get a sense. Thanks. Great. Again, Tony, if you just hold and we'll collect Christ yeah. Christ Christine and then Paul. Yep. If you could roll back to the four examples, please. Um, so the more we look at this, and um, I've had a little time to think about some of this because of our meeting last Friday. Um, my favorite is still the brick over slate. The first original look looks really beautiful. Um, I'm not crazy about the all anything. Um, so I don't know if I feel as um, strongly against the medalist, Paul, but I, I could be swayed over cost. And I know, Tony, you're saying you don't have that kind of um, amount, but maybe that's what I personally am gonna come down to wrestling with what I like the most and what it costs. So 
if there's any savings. And sometimes when it's on sale, you grow to like it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Christine and Alex, if you're <laughs> if you're done with your questions, if you take down your hand, that would be oh, great. Yeah. Sure. Paul? So two questions. One is um, do you, when you mix and match materials, do you worry about those interacting with each other? They expand and contract at different rates during weather. And so when you have brick over slate or metal over slate, do you worry about that? And the second thing is just sort of a design aesthetic that you're bringing to this project. And maybe I'm late to the game on this is that it's very um, handsome, sedate, um, uh, you know, classic. And I'm wondering if you are thinking of any sort of um, flashy design feature or anything that was like jump out and say, you know, like color um, <laughs> or something like that, that might be signature um, that you, people would say, wow, there, anything with the wow effect, if you're thinking of that or is, or is the in, instruction to the design team to say, no, we want this to fit in and sort of recede from and not be too um, flashy. Thank you, Tony. So I'll start with Alex's uh, question. This is related to the color of the brick, um, red, and versus what we're showing. And then the second is the representation, the rendering versus the um, color of the brick. So I'm going to come back to this here. So I'll start with this first. Um, I, I think uh, ultimately we would want to have the real samples with us and ideally on site. That's ultimately how most of the projects are done uh, because as you probably all know renderings can only take us so far. And even a renderer's interpretation and what people even see on their screens now mm -hmm. can actually vary. Somebody says, oh, that looks great to me. And somebody else says, that looks brown to me. And then people's own sense of color varies from person to person, right? So I think the ultimate best way we're gonna get at this, Alex, is actually when we finally decide what materials we're going at, then we have the real sample. So for example, it's the Magnolia Ridge or it's Cordoba or something else we'll actually have a number of these things with us and then we'll talk. And I, I do agree with you that these real photographs of real built work like this one here, this one here even, which is a bit more grayish, it shows a lot of variation and ultimately brick will do that. So it's gonna be a lot richer than what the renderings are showing because it does look flat here. This kind of looks mostly grayish or variations on gray. I, I think it will ultimately be a, a lot more opportunities to have you know life. So. Uh, I think that's what that will be predicated that. And then with respect to the color, the reason why we moved away from red is because I think for us, really the, the, the sense of trying to be complementary to this is where we're driving all of this discussion. So the, the beauty of your existing building is that it has such a rich palette here embedded in the kind of materials of the stone between warm grays, browns, tans, creams. And it's actually, it's a wonderful, way in some ways to key off of. So that affords us in a lot of ways to create a kind of a rich but subdued palette um, on the proposed edition because we can actually zeroing out on this. And so when again, if we have real samples on site, we'll say, ah, oh, okay, I see that brick picks up on this or I, I get it now, or it's, it's tending more towards this. So I think that's what's wonderful about your library will allow us to do that. Um, with respect to Christina's comments about the brick over slate and cost, absolutely. I, I think we, we, we ourselves, if I had to render judgment internally, I think we still very much like, I think the original design that we have been all working on with you, which is having a contrast between the upper part and the lower part. So I, I think we, we tend to agree with this, but I think we, in, we had to do this other in order to get your opinions uh, in order to see whether you liked anything else. Uh, and, and clearly we're seeing that you're reaffirming where we already started with. I, I'm not hearing something differing from that. The cost, of course, is going to come into play. And when we have that information, uh, Christine and the committee, then that will help, I think, inform a number of this discussion. And if, for example, let's just say that, and I'm just speculating, if one was like twice as expensive as another material, and of course, I know we have, we have to deal with budget, um, that will render some choices here because we have to find some way uh, to save costs. So let's wait to see what happens from the estimator, and then we can have more informed discussion. And then finally, with respect to, uh, I think your comments or questions, Paul, um, on the mix and match of materials, um, uh, certainly when we design a detailed buildings and particularly exterior materials, we always take into account the nature of the materials that allow for proper expansion and contraction and the way materials react to one another. Uh, fortunately, of course, uh, in an example, a combination of brick with stone, uh, this is done all the time in many places. And this is fairly common. And of course, the beauty of this material, it really weathers well in New England. So, 
um, it, and, and they probably have less expansion attraction issues than comparatively to some other materials. But, but of course, we would look very carefully as we design the materials and how we design the details. Um, and the issue of um, flashiness, I guess that was the term you use if I heard you correctly, versus quiet. Um, I, I think we, we, we felt at the end of the day that we wanted to create something that was going to be clearly of our time or of its time, but also complementary. And so for us, I think it really came back to thinking carefully about this. Um, uh, there were earlier iterations in the earlier design phases where there was something that was much more contrasted against this. But I think at the end of the day, when we all came back to this and we had a lot of reviews, a lot of comments and feedback, we ended up saying that we want it to be something that's respectful of this. So hence this somewhat almost kind of in some ways contemporary gambrel forms, right? What you can see here, the use of natural materials, a quieter palette. But but yet I think when you look at this, this clearly is going to look, you know, pretty contemporary. Uh, the windows are bigger, the scale is larger, there's going to be a lot of natural light coming into the library. So I think it's gonna be kind of a quiet, um, but we hope elegant uh, design that is going to really bring forth um, a you know, joyful place to be in a library. Thank you, Tony. Can you go up one slide again, please? Sure. So I, um, I wanna say that uh, you know, anything is possible, but I'm imagining this view in all metal so the metal roof with the metal uh, siding. And I, I'm having trouble seeing the complementarity. So that's just one thing uh, that I think about when I think about the metal. Uh, how is this gonna look from this view? If you have this metal roof and then this, the metal siding, it doesn't feel great to me. Mm -hmm. uh, like others, I like the, the differentiation between the base and the other um, and the other part of the uh, and the other part of the library, and I I hope we can end up there depending on the depending on the cost. But I it would take um, it would take a little bit for me to get used to the metal uh, and think that that's the right choice for this library. Now again, if it comes down to it's, that's the only place where we can achieve a, a, the cost savings necessary to stay within our budget, then maybe that's a different conversation. But I myself would not want you to put a lot of oomph into uh, thinking about metal at this point, because I think the other materials uh, are just so much better in terms of what it is that we're trying to achieve. So I've got uh, Christine and then Anika. Christine? Thank you. So Austin, I, I agree with you. I, so I'm glad we have this picture up because it reminds me and I have to keep reminding myself that the front of the building is the most important and that is where our beauty is. The old 19, 20, 29 building there is gorgeous. And I agree with Austin that, um, so the side that is also very visible there, the new addition part, I have a hard time, you know, I, thinking metal roof and then you know with lines going up and down and then horizontal lines more metal on the side so if we could roll them out back to the back options again I just want to ask Tony to think about we had talked about a, some different options before could could and I don't know we'd have to see like yeah that metal one would be good if, um so number four, if it was only metal on the, and I don't know the architectural, the ends of the massings, mm -hmm. and then maybe on the side parts do brick or something. And if that would be any bit of a cost savings when he's figuring this out, because um, that is the back of the building. And of course we want all of it to be attractive. But again, as we're looking at cost, maybe, you know, you, you're not always as concerned about the back as much as you are the front or the side, the parts that are visible. And my last question part to Tony when he's looking at this is, so if I was going shopping for brick for my own home, you know, are there different uh, levels or makers of brick where that can be the savings? Like, or that, you know, there's the high end, gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful, or the, you know, still attractive, but maybe a less expensive, brick option. Thank you. Okay. 
and I guess any kind of Sorry, I'm having a difficulty with uh, my connection. Um, if we could, well, my comment is on that side view um, that we were just looking at. Um, I really appreciate the that transition. I know we weren't able to see um, the addition with um, the front, but even just seeing from the side, uh, yes. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know that the coloring, the coloring may be off, but I think that uh, this is really just such a beautiful job going from um, historical, like a really smooth transition going from the historical facade um, to more contemporary design. And um, I really appreciate you pointing out how the palette is used um, to go without it really, um, I think it, it really does add a nice flow and sophistication to the uh, the total uh, design like that. And um, yeah, I just, I really, uh, I applaud you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Anika. I can also get lost in that type of bringing out colors. <laughs> <laughs> All the days. We welcome your, your feedback <laughs> for sure. Thank you. Okay, Tony, back to you. Okay, so I, again, I think that, um, the, the observation about, I'm, I'm gonna go back to this view. So the observation about the opportunity to consider the two, what we're calling the end facade uh, of the kind of gambrel contemporary version of it. And then the sides being a different material. Absolutely, we can look at that. Um, and it may be that kind of thing where it says, okay, this is a you know reasonable amount of material here. And if the metal proves to be, you know, fairly less expensive than the brick, uh, then sure, we can, we can see what the consequences of, how much and what, what's the savings? The other question you raised about the quality of the brick. Um, yes, there are different qualities. Uh, uh, for example, um, another project we've used, uh, what we called sort of a Norman brick. Um, and we, we like that because it's a little bit longer than a traditional brick. So for example, traditional bricks are typically about eight inches long, you know, two and three eighths inch high. The Norman brick is that high, but they can stretch it 12 inches long. It makes actually a difference because um, a lot of institutional projects, um, if they're able to do it, I mean, we've done it ourselves, like the Norman brick, because it almost looks a little bit more substantial. Um, it actually stretches the horizontality in, and it makes, it actually makes the sense of scale lower because the brick is getting longer. Um, but there is some cost, there is some cost differential. Um, you save on some part because there's less brick involved because there's longer, but the brick is a little bit more specialty brick. So, uh, you know, but that's a, that's a sub variation. The other way um, which we've also, thought about, um, but we, we'd have to do more research. So there's some products um, which is called a thin brick, uh, but don't think of it like the, like the really cheap, you know, brick master. It looks like wallpaper. So it actually looks like brick um, from the outside, but it's actually made up of more panelization. So it comes in larger sheets. And then it, it has the illusion of, not the illusion, it's real brick, but it's not as thick as traditional brick, because it's actually, that's what they call it, thin brick. And so that sometimes is used for an economical way to apply brick. Now, we have to be careful here because the variation in quality and perhaps the variation in actually the brick may be not the same as traditional brick. So in other words, if we go to a product like that, they tend to have a more limited palette because they're like pre-selecting down to this versus, of course, brick can come with a huge range of color. So. Um, that, but that isn't that isn't sub alternate to the brick decision vis-a-vis -vis cost. Um, so I, I think for us, um, since we're trying to look at these various options and and waiting till you have cost information to get more informed, um, once we have at least within the base scheme, even of these four, we'll be able to know pretty quickly. Like, okay, well, clearly these two are in the ballpark to one another, but that one is like quite a bit more, and this one is quite a bit less that's gonna bracket you right away by, all right, now we kind of have a more informed decision to make here. So right. I'm sorry, again, I'm sorry we can't share that with you until we have it, but uh, hopefully by the time we get the cost editor to give us this information, we'll, we'll be able to do this more uh, concretely. So Tony, uh, have we given you enough? Uh, so I wanted everybody to have a chance to see, see what you were um, thinking about. It seems that there's some concerns about the metal it seems that there's a preference for the 
the different with the, the base material from the from the rest of the material. Uh, I have we given you what you need at this point. I guess I believe you have, Austin. And thank you all for giving this very critical feedback. All right, one one second before you, Paul. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. So. And I have, again, late to the game here, but one of the things I want this library to be is that it, when you have the out, outside visitors coming, you want to say, you got to come see our library. Mm -hmm. um, the one where I felt that most intimately is the uh, Graham Gunn's design of uh, the Lincoln Library in Lincoln, Mass, which I felt like they did a marvelous addition um, to that library. And I was like, oh, this is where I would like, if I had a guest there, if I lived in Lincoln, which I would never be able to afford to do. But um, so it's, the, and that's sort of, I want people to come here when, after we finish this project, that everybody wants to bring their kids and their grandkids down to see it because it's so special. So that's that's what my uh, aesthetic is trying to accomplish with this, if we can afford it. That's the first me measure. Oh, absolutely. I, we're, we're very much on the same page, Paul, and we want to create the highest quality library that we can within the constraints and parameters that we are charged with. I think we're all on the same page with, with that. That's been the instruction in a way right from the beginning. So, yep, Alex? Yeah, I just wanted to make a request, and I don't know whether this is to Sharon or to FAA, but once we get the cost differentials, um, I'd like to be able to take the different picture options to be able to, as part of our community outreach, let people know the decisions that we're making, but I don't want to do that until people know there's a cost associated with it, so it's not necessarily pick your favorite choice, but I just want to be able to get copies of all of this so that we can do that, so just making that request. Thank you. No, no, no problem. We never buy this. Oh, okay. So, Christine, I think we're, we're we've done the work of the design uh, subcommittee report. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Until um, FAA has more to bring to us to think about, this is where we're at. Great. And uh, Tony and colleagues, um, tremendous thanks for the work that you're doing, Craig. Oh, thank you, Austin. Yes, I, I, I wanted to say, you know, thank you to Feingold Alexander for pulling this information together so quickly. Um, I think we just met at the end of last week and, and they did a great job assembling it and making it uh, digestible for everybody. Um, then the other thing I wanted to uh, ask is I have a, a simple report. I don't know if now's the time to do it about um, some uh, ever sources um, incentives. Um, so it's something that's kind of in the design subcommittee. Yeah. Discussion, yeah, or I can talk about it later in the meeting after we hear the um, uh, the outreach subcommittee. If it's okay, let's hear it now. Fantastic. All right, I'll share my screen again. Are we all set with FAA? Um, so, yeah, Alex. Are we are we talking about gender inclusive bathrooms and the elevator today? And is no, that a part of that or not? No, we're not talking about that yet, Alex. Oh. We're going to have to share that the next time. Got it. Okay, thank you. Um, should we sign off? Are we are we good with everyone? Do you need any more questions I, to us? I think unless anybody speaks, I think you're free to go. Okay, thank you very much, and have a great evening. We appreciate all your comments. Thank thanks you. Thanks, for, thank thanks you. for your work. Thank you. Bye bye. All, all right, Craig. Let's let's hear about the incentives. All right. Oops. Make sure I'm sharing the right screen here. Share screen. Third time's a charm. Okay. So we had a nice meeting with um, Eversource last week. Uh, Feingold Alexander was present. Also Sharon and Christine were, were there. And uh, the representative, uh, Sharina, gave us a quick overview of what our project uh, may be eligible for. So in brief, there are these different paths to getting incentives, and these are all mass save incentives, kind of uh, rebates almost. Um, the one that this project seems most eligible for is actually their highest level, and it's uh, you know path one. It's a, a net zero energy ready building or a low EUI building, and EUI is an acronym that stands for Energy Use Index. It's basically uh, a number that you can compare from one building to another how much energy that building is using. So within this path one, their, their highest incentives, uh, they have two tiers. 
Uh, tier one is if you've got an EUI, that energy use index of 30 or less. Tier two, um, and I'll talk about briefly how much money we potentially um, could receive on this project. Tier two is if the energy, the goal is uh, between 31 and 35. And so to put that in perspective, the design team advised that we've got a 63,000 square foot building and the current understanding is an EUI of 34. So that puts us right here in tier two, but um, the goal is actually 29. So over as the design develops, that's, you know, we, we can anticipate we're gonna be somewhere in that range. So potentially this tier one um, and, but also uh, potentially tier two. So there are a couple different ways that we can sort of uh, get money from Eversource or it's actually MassSave. If we go with this tier one route, uh, the building is designed and constructed for an energy use uh, index of 30 or less. We can actually realize $2 per square foot of building. Um, if it's tier two, it's $1.50. And so doing you know some quick math, that puts us anywhere from 94,000 to $126,000 rebate. Wow. And so that's, uh, there's all, you know, so that's a good incentive. Um, so that's one way to get some incentive money. Another is um, if, if the design includes a heat pump, there are these various technologies that we could realize some money from that. Not as large as these figures, um, but some more incentive money. Um, that's one sort of the design. And then that money could be collected or given, you know, reimbursed at the end of construction. The other program that they just started up is um, post occupancy verification. So you do all that stuff at the beginning of the project, you get your check or your rebate uh, for that design work. But then for a year, you um, monitor, you verify the energy, actual energy consumption of the building. And they have uh, a couple pay points for that as well, either a dollar fifty per you know per square foot, so it's another potential ninety four thousand. Um, if you hit your target, or um, seventy five cents a square foot, so you know half of that, so maybe another forty seven thousand. If you uh, the actual use does not match, uh, doesn't achieve the um, the the design you know, EUI. And that's, you know, this is part, part of this incentive program is um, MassSave and Eversource want to understand, you know, does the uh, energy that you plan for translate to the energy that actually gets used? And so it's kind of a uh, mutually beneficial exercise. And then there's also some other smaller incentives for if you um, go for a you know, net zero certification, they'll give you $3,000 towards that. Um, the, the verification process, they'll split the cost of that up to $10,000. Um, so there's you know, lots of ways that we could um, realize as much as even um, a quarter of a million dollars yeah. by going through this program. And um, they show, they get, uh, Sharina gave us a timeline. So you can see, so this is similar to my, the schedules that I present uh, across the top here are the different phases, or this is the timeline and they have different colors for different phases. So as you can see, there are activities, um, submissions kind of that happen throughout the course of the project. So it is a it is somewhat of a commitment that you are um, entering into this agreement with Eversource. And, um, and the way that commitment manifests itself is they have this uh, memorandum of understanding, which outlines the program. Um, and at the bottom, you know, uh, the customer obviously has to read through everything, make sure that they're comfortable with it. And both the customer, you know, town of Amherst, actually, I think it's uh, the Jones library because of, uh, they consider the customer whoever pays the electric meter um, and the design team sign. And that's the first step in this long process um, here. So we are actually at schematic design. So um, we, you know, the very first thing is this, engage in the program step number one so we'd be doing that now if um if the the town is interested in pursuing that so i'll send all this information over to uh, actually, i'll probably send it through angela 
to distribute to everyone on the library building committee um, and the, the design subcommittee. Um, there may be some questions. I'm sure there'll be some questions because this is, you know, it's a whole program. It's not just a, um, a one and done um, activity, but um, I do think there is some great potential here to um, cash in on some of the incentives that MassSave is offering. Uh, Craig, does this involve any any cost to us? Are there is there design work or anything else that would otherwise not have to be done that will have to be done if we go into this program? Um, I believe that the design team is engaged for this design portion. So this just has to do with so that short answer is I do not think that there is any additional design costs okay. that you have to pay. Okay. However, there may be some extra costs that get cooked into the building. Mm -hmm. So to achieve these lower mm -hmm. EUIs, there may be, you know, a higher efficiency piece of equipment that you purchase that if you purchase just say a regular piece of equipment or regular efficiency, you know, maybe there is a little more cost and or there is some potential more cost in construction. Um, once we get to that post occupancy phase, that would represent additional, not necessarily design fees, but additional professional fees. So you'd is, have a, a, a fair is there, company. can one enter into this program and then opt out along the way? That's a question. So the, the answer to that may be in this memorandum of understanding, okay. which I have not read all the way through. Okay. Uh, but if it's not, that is something I can ask. Um, okay. Uh, ever source. So if it's like, hey, this isn't, turns out this is not working for us, um, I'll, I'll look into that and see if that is an option. Yeah, we'd want to know that. Yep. Okay. Any other questions at this stage about the energy incentives, Sharon? You know, one of the things that they did say was, so you, you would be telling them you are aiming for this EUI, but if you don't meet it, that's okay. She was clear when she said, um, the memorandum of understanding that you would sign is not a binding contract. So you don't, right. if you don't hit the number, that's okay. But I, I do have, a, it's an interesting question about, so library versus the town and the trustees are gonna have to sign the memorandum of, of understanding. And I'm, I guess I'm just interested in how that needs to flow both for Craig and Eversource and the, how does that all work? That is well, a great question that I'll have to look into. <laughs> And I assume that we will discuss this as a committee and the town manager and the finance director will weigh in in their views about how it fits into the energy conservation and sustainability program for the town and the trustees on a recommendation from the building committee will weigh in as well. Okay, thank you, Craig. So uh, the next item on our agenda is a report from uh, I, I, Alex. We. Were you raising a hand to give the report? Did you have a question about the? Yeah, I, I had a question, if that's OK. I, I, I just wanted to touch base about the schematic designs that were received on May 27th. So I'm not sure. We obviously can't join the design subcommittee. So I guess I just wanted to understand the process of when this group might ask questions, weigh in. like. I want to better understand the process around the designs, the schematics as they're developed for this group. Craig, do you want to say something about the way in which uh, this, the schematics will come to the group? Um, so the way I understand it to work is that uh, the design team is going to make regular presentations to the design subcommittee. Uh, and the design subcommittee will take a look at that, look at that, and then when it comes time to make decisions, uh, design subcommittee will be making a recommendation to the library building committee who will then make the actual decision or give direction to the design team. If you have anything that you want to say about those schematics, uh, this is a time when you might say it. Alex? Great. Yeah, no, I just had a, a couple of, of questions um, on the schematics. And it's my understanding, I'm not going to read anything into the furniture as drawn and it's also my understanding that for example the brunette art gallery doesn't show you know a storage area that that's all things we'll likely to see more in the design development phase is my understanding so i guess i want to make sure that's correct understanding um and on the um 
So the social worker in residence um, and the artist in residence, I didn't see anywhere on here. And so again, that might be a, they exist, but it just needs to become clear. And then the same with the literacy project. I know that the literacy project and ESL are in the same area, but I wasn't sure, like are the coordinators sharing an office? Like I wasn't really sure how that was working and wanted to understand that. And then my other question was that the teens, there was a conversation about having a separate exit for the teens and in the schematic, it looks like there's something there, but I don't know if that's like an existing something that's going away or if that is a potential and just needs to be developed. So those were kind of my off the, Great. oh no, and I have, I have one, sorry, one last one. Um, I guess I want to, I know that there's for the Civil War tablets, like I, I know there's a separate committee around the Civil War tablets. Um, and I know the plan is to have them in here, um, but I guess I just wanted to better understand because if whatever's ultimately decided on changes the space programming, I guess I just want to make sure that that's all flowing in the way that it should be flowing. Sharon, do you want to respond to what Alex has asked? Yeah. Um, so the, I, I hadn't, I hadn't noticed that the social worker in residence or the artist in residence wasn't there because I, I thought they were uh, in near the adult circulation desk. Um, so I think that's where they're supposed to be and they won't, they're, they won't be permanent fixtures. It's just, it's square footage for in case um, when there is an artist or there isn't a social worker, they would come in and then they would set up their table, but then the table would go away eventually. So that's what I think about that. Um, the literacy project, great question. So the literacy project, it, it, they're going to have those two classrooms um, during their academic year from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And after that, it transfers over. That's when ESL will be able to use that space. And as far as the literacy project coordinator, they will be located in those two classroom spaces. The separate exit for the teens, um, that's, I, it's a question for the architects and I, I have not, I, I don't think I've heard that discussion yet. The only thing that concerns me about that is, um, then, uh, then people would have access to the first floor after hours. And I'm worried about that. Like right now we've got all the after hours access to the building on the ground floor. And that seems very neat and clean, um, uh, you know, for alarm purposes, for security purposes, the minute you open up the first floor, I start to get a little more nervous, but the, the architect could tell me to stop being nervous, Sharon. It would also have to be made handicapped accessible. And again, that's another that's another architect question. And the Civil War tablets, I, I am thrilled that you asked. I think that we in the design committee needs need to figure out how to how to get input from that committee, as well as the Burnett Art Gallery Committee. Um, so that yeah, those are my answers. And we talked about the teen exit. Christine, do you want to do you want to share some of the conversation we had? Yeah, I, if I can redefine my question, I'm, I'm as as per usual not asking my question clearly. Um, so first of all, now that you've pointed out the teeny tiny writing, I do see the artist and resident, and I see the social worker and resident. So thank you, I found them. Um, my question was when I'm looking at the schematic, there to the top right as you look down there is a door and a set of stairs and I guess I was trying to understand is what I'm looking at the drawing stairs are they internal stairs or are they external stairs because I think the question is not to have after hour access into the building it's more like an emergency exit that people so can let, just pop let, out of yeah let Sharon answer it okay Sharon yeah yeah so uh that door from the what is now the fiction room that right now isn't it's it's an exterior door uh, with the it's a it's a steep steep staircase um, it's there right now it's only for emergency purposes right now great thank you Christine yeah so the uh, schematic design the designer keeps coming back as they keep 
making more and more changes. And it is mostly more about, uh, just to confirm that, about walls and area of programming rather than like furniture or anything like that at this point. But right. I want to ask, and maybe Angie is the one who can tell us, where can the public find the ongoing list of these different renditions of schematic design? Um, sometimes they're in the packet or they get posted later in the minutes, but I'm wondering like, where can people find them? Because they are big documents, but if you are looking at them at home, you can really zoom in and look at the, the different parts. Does so, anyone know? Yeah, I yeah. think we're all seeing them for the first time at those meetings. They don't, they haven't been reaching me in advance of those meetings. And yep. so we could probably better streamline that process. I'm happy to discuss with Austin and with Sharon the best way to organize that on um, the town's webpage. Great. But right now they they can be found in the packets and I'm having to ask for them after seeing them for the first time with you at these meetings. Great, thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank Al you. Uh, yeah. oh, Alex? I was just gonna add to that the answer. Um, okay. Well, I think the question was, where can the public see them? And they're actually, the minute that we get them, they're posted on the library building Great. project website. And then every newsletter has a link to each of the versions of the schematics. Great, thanks so much. Anika. Excuse me again for my, my uh, delays here. That's okay. Uh, so I just wanted to confirm, is there, that there rather, was still time to be able to speak on, um, to see what, what room there is for Civil War tablets, um, to see if to, um, to explore a dedicated space as opposed to a war monument on the wall, because they, um, you know, as a dedicated, as with dedicated space, they could really bring a uh, type of gallery and, um, donations level of sophistication within a gallery that does not exist um, in Amherst at the moment. Sharon, do you want to say a little bit about the conversation about the Civil War tablets? I, I, I feel like this is this is process and um, uh, be, because we have the Burnett Art Gallery and, and also the Civil War tablet group who would like some one on one time with the architects and I'm just I'm not sure how this committee or, or the OPM or the architects want to handle that. Well, it, it is the case now, is it not that the schematic design does not contemplate a dedicated space for the Civil War tablets is that the case. Correct. So I think that just needs to be said that right now, that is not part of the schematic design process. And if the committee wants it to be, the committee needs to speak up clearly about it. If the committee wants it to be, then of course the question is what is gonna be, you know, what is gonna be moved or how is it gonna be moved around? So I see Christine and then uh, Paul, Christine. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I see, you know, time is just flying here and I'm looking at the calendar and looking at Craig's calendar. Um, so I, I'm, uh, maybe I'm tossing this to Sharon and, and others here. Should we have a meeting, a design subcommittee uh, on the 24th of June, and then we're into July and time is really getting short. Does uh, the Burnett Gallery group or the, um, or this, the tablet group or a sustainability group, like do any of these people need to come and say like, when do we give them an opportunity to speak? Kind of that's exactly that's exactly what I'm asking. I also because there's a cost. I think the Burnett Gallery needing a closet in their room that that has been in the plans all along. But as far as the Civil War tablets go, as Austin said, the plan all along has been the Galleria. Um, and so if there is going to be another room created somehow, there is an added cost to that. And, and so that's bigger than just the design committee, I feel like. I feel like yeah. that decision needs to be made here. Right. Paul? So, so yeah, I, I want to make sure we have that purposeful discussion. I, I, I mean, we early on the decision was made to include the Burnett Gallery, but not a dedicated space for the Civil War tablets. I think we need to have that conversation, whether we agree, continue to agree with that um, allocation of space that way, or if there's another space or something else that has to happen. Um, 
and I think you're right to say we need to involve folks in uh, early at this moment in time and invite them to your meeting. I think Christine to say, here's where we are, let us know what you think and then get that feedback. I think it's much better to do it earlier than later. And this is the time, but I do wanna make sure it's on the agenda for us to talk about how we um, address the need for space for these Civil War tablets. Yep, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just have a question around. So the original um, um, building program, right, didn't have a separate space for for these tablets. Um, just like the original design didn't have a net zero ready building, right? And then there was a process around that, and a decision was made to you know to do that. So I guess from my perspective, you know, if there's a desire to have an add-on space, is is it a relatively easy thing to have the art, to know what that space, what the desired space requirements are, how many square footage, and to find out from the architects, you know, if we add 200 square feet to this building that's not currently contemplated, um, what is that cost? And then is that a question of whether town pays or there's fundraising for it? Or, I mean, I, I don't see it necessarily being in our, cost structure because it's beyond the scope of what we originally decided. But I, I mean, I could be wrong. That's kind of where I'm coming from is if there's a desire to sort of change uh, the plans to include this, just, you know, having having concrete numbers so that we can figure out who and how to pay for it, if that's how people want to move forward. Craig. Thank you, Austin. Something else to consider, and I don't know what the, the actual situation is, but um, we don't know how far the design has gone. We have, you know, the plans, but um, at a certain point, adding in program spaces will have such a large impact that um, it would actually could could delay us on the schedule and also could incur additional design fees. And again, I don't know if we're at that point yet, but that is just something that uh, to keep in mind. So that would be a discussion that we have to have with Feingold Alexander. Discussion doesn't cost anything. We could just talk about it uh, and then ask for their you know, uh, their, their feedback on that. I feel like that's the answer. If we could, if you all agree, it, if we could ask the architects, hey, listen, this is something we would like to explore. Um, tell us how much it would cost to explore. When is the deadline for exploring this? So that we could actually see, as Alex was saying, where the space would come from if square footage is not being added and or if it could be added, how much extra does that cost? And, and then we can talk about how that gets paid for, or you know, if we're talking an additional million dollars, it just can't happen. Paul? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not talking about adding space. I'm talking about reprogramming an existing space perhaps um, and looking at how we're allocating space. Um, clearly this is something that we need to address. And I just wanna make sure we have a purposeful discussion. We schedule time to do that. Sure, the Civil War tablets is, are, is a big issue in this library. We're not talking about a small space. We're talking about a lot of space. So uh, it is very, con very consequential. And I think we'll ask Christine on the design subcommittee to uh, schedule some time for it. We'll get together with Craig and we'll figure out what it is that we need by way of information. If there is, um, uh, a, a, a desire on the part of the committee for a dedicated a room, uh, it, it would be good to hear that because uh, I do think it's very consequential uh, for, the, for the design, Christine and then Anika. I just wanna be clear how we're, we're thinking we're gonna handle this. So uh, there's the next meeting that this could fit in would be June 24th. Are we saying we invite someone from this Burnett or Tet, like who are we inviting? And I ask, you know, we request for FAA to be there. Is that what we're trying to go for for the 24th? And who are we asked, like, who are the contacts or how do I find out who we're talking to? Right, Anika, can you, can you, uh, uh, Anika next and then we'll figure that out. Sure, well, I, I am on the Civil War Tablet Committee, so I'm one. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but I, I wanted to uh, appreciate uh, 
Paul Welcome's comment, and I just wanted to add to give some give uh, us something to to think about. Um, I do believe that a thoughtful discussion of where these will go will be one of the most inclusive things that we can do. Uh, the tablets, the folks on it, they predate the library. Some of them predate the colonies. Um, you have folks that bridge the town to the acts that ended slavery in America. And um, you know, during our outreach, um, during the outreach open house, which was wonderful, um, one of uh, the counselors I watched this, um, this was actually in special collections and her children were there and there was no one that they could look at there that looks like them, you know, and it's, you know, I, we need to, to think about that and realize the impact. So yes, we can have a war monument or we can have something that highlights this the grit and, and freedom and the acts of members that were also very important in this community. So I hope that we can look and think about these tablets with that lens as we uh, move forward and think about whether or not they deserve uh, a dedicated space. Thank you, Anika. Anika, can you uh, be in touch with Christine about either yourself or someone else or you and someone else uh, uh, coming and speaking about the Civil War tablets with the design subcommittee. Sure. That would be, that would be great. Okay, Christine. Right, okay. thanks. Okay, Alex. Yeah, I just have one question. Um, so uh, I think, you know, having a dedicated space museum, you know, exhibit uh, room is obviously a, a really wonderful idea um, and, and for me, I guess the question is, um, you know, I assume we have to go back to the MBLC if we're, like if we ultimately decide, yes, we're going to create a dedicated space for these, that's something that the MBLC has to sign off on or is there a way, and, and would it even be desirable from the Civil War Tablet Committee if we were to expand the special collections exhibit room and have part dedicated to the, like I'm wondering if there's a way to change the Galleria so that the Galleria is smaller and expand the special collections, um, you know, exhibit space to then sort of have a dedicated space that's a museum like or exhibit like area. Like, I, I don't know what's possible, but um, if, if, we're, if we're taking away from a different program in the building. It's my understanding that requires the MBLC to sign off on it. So let's let's uh, let Christine and the design committee uh, meet with the people from the Civil War Tablets group. Let's hear what uh, they have to say. Craig can help us coordinate with the FAA uh, to at least give a heads up to FAA that this is a question which is now on the table, the design committee will design subcommittee will vet it and hear it and bring it back to this um, and bring it back to this committee. Okay, we are we're getting on six o'clock here. Alex, report from the outreach committee, and then Sean, uh, Alex, before you go, Sean, we're going to want some financial update. All good news. You want, me to, you want me to deliver that now? No, I want um, you to wait until after Alex's okay. report. Okay, I'll okay. prepare for that. Great, thanks. Alex? I think the head's the heads up. Um, so uh, not, I mean, we, so the Outreach Study Committee has not met since our last um, Jones Library Building Committee meeting. Um, but in terms of community outreach, we've been now to the Amherst Survival Center um, the last two Thursdays. Um, and we've actually been incorporating sort of a campaign around uh, bringing out information about program and services that are available um, so that people know <laughs> what they can get with a library card as well as um, actually issuing library cards on site. Um, and then we've also been collecting feedback as well. So that's sort of a multi-pronged approach. Um, still at the right. farmer's market, on June 1, we had our schematic design presentation, um, which is a recorded meeting. Um, we did collect feedback, which is in uh, the uh, public document that you all have access to. 
um, specific to teens, um, our um, head of young adult went on June 1st to the high school um, during the entire lunch block, um, signing kids up for uh, library cards, telling them about summer reading program, but then also collecting um, uh, what teens want to see in their space. Um, and then the librarian at the high school has graciously agreed to keep a comment board up in the library um, that will continue to be collecting. Um, in the works is trying to also do the middle school um, as well as Summit Academy. And then we're also working with Amherst Recreation around um, talking to teens through those avenues. Um, there's also online survey responses that we're getting back that are specific for teens. They were created for teens. Those aren't entirely in the public comments that you have. I haven't quite figured out how to put them in yet because they're they're very specific. It's almost better for me to send you the package of teens. I don't know what to do with that yet, but just know that that exists out there. Um, the Padlet, which is the image, we've gotten 65 comments, 83 reactions, and 36 people have contributed to that. So we have some, some skimmers out there, which is nice. Um, we also are getting feedback in, we're getting uh, the library form that people can submit a blind, we're getting emails coming in, um, we're getting things through Amherst Talks, so the nice thing is we're getting, we're seeing activity in all the various channels that we're doing, which is nice. Um, as of uh, two days ago, we were up to 371 unique comments, uh, 1,456 comments in total when you add frequency, which is pretty darn good, I think. Um, and then um, coming up uh, tomorrow from 7 to 8.30, we have a community engagement forum. It's virtual online. Um, and then we will be at Village Park on June 11th for another community event in that apartment from 12 to 4. Um, I think that's my quick update. Thank you, Alex. And thank, mm -hmm. you for all, thank you for all the, the, good, the, good, the good work that you are doing. Anika. I just wanted to add that on top of all that, Alex had time to join me for uh, office hours at the senior center today, on top of all of that. Great, thank you. Thanks for doing that. Any other question for the outreach committee? All right, again, thank you to Alex and the committee. Sean, financial update. So there's not much. We continue to pay our bills. Uh, we don't have many bills yet. Uh, these will get more exciting when we dive into construction and, and we're looking at fancy charts uh, that the OPM will provide in terms of you know staying on track and staying on budget. Um, maybe in the future, I don't know, you know, I'd love to share in or, or Austin if you if you think it's worthwhile updating on the fundraising goals. But everything I see looks positive. Um, yep. All the emails and, and headlines I see look sound positive. So there's not really much to report other than. Um, you know, we're, we're still paying all our bills and moving forward with the OPM and and uh, looking uh, to move forward with the designer soon. Right. And you have no invoices for us to approve. I didn't see any unless, Craig, you I didn't see any new ones come in. So I assume I'll okay. get one soon for the month of May, but I didn't see Correct. one come in. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. OK. Any questions about the financial update? OK. Uh, there is no no correspondence that we have received that I know of. Uh, there are no topics not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Uh, we have three members of the public. Thank you very much for attending. Now is an opportunity for public comment. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please signify by raising your virtual hand. Okay, I see no virtual hands being uh, being raised. I wanna thank you all again for a very productive meeting. It was wonderful to hear from the architects about the exterior of the building. Craig? Oh, thanks, Austin. Uh, before we concluded, I just wanted to introduce uh, a new member to our team coming from my office. Colliers is uh, Will Fernandez, who's new to the company and uh, will be uh, assisting on this project. And I know some of you have already met him in uh, various subcommittees, but I just wanted to uh, introduce him to everyone here. Will, say, say hello and share any cost-saving ideas that you have. Great to meet everyone. I'm gonna back pocket all my savings ideas uh, later down the line, but uh, I'll be sure to throw, sprinkle those out throughout the project. Thank you, Will. We look forward to your working with you. Thanks for the help that you will, that you will give us. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn.
So moved. moved. Thank you. It's, well, having heard so moved, that's from two people. We'll consider it seconded. Okay, Christine. Yes, yes. Paul. Yes. Anika. Yes. Sean. Yes. Sharon. Yes. Alex. Yes. Austin, and again, great thanks to Angie for her wonderful, wonderful help. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. Good night.